Hello and welcome to The Conversation Weekly. This week, as military tensions mount again between China and Taiwan, we talk to experts about China's longer-term reunification strategy and what that means for Taiwan. China under Xi Jinping keep trying to ramp up pressure and push the threshold without trying to go into war outright. And the damage done when North Americans pretend to have indigenous identity. One day they can be white settler colonials, the next day they'll be indigenous, whereas we'll always be indigenous and we'll never be fully welcome in, in white spaces. I'm Dan Reno in San Francisco. And I'm Gemma Ware in London. You're listening to The Conversation Weekly, the world explained by experts. Hi, Wenty. How are you today? Hey, Justin. I'm good. How are you? Well, thank you. Um, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. This is our colleague, Justin Bergman, Senior Deputy Politics Editor at The Conversation in Melbourne. He's talking to Wenty Sung, a sessional lecturer in Taiwan Studies at the Australian National University and an expert on the US-China-Taiwan relationship. Okay. And you're in Taipei right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's a great place to be. Uh, lots of attention being paid to it around the world. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. And what does it feel like in Taiwan right now? I mean, what's the general mood of the people given what's been happening the last few weeks? Uh, general mood is that I think people are calm on the whole. Like I was going to this diner uh, a bit earlier for my lunch. And the TV there at the diner was playing um, Chinese President Xi Jinping showing his um, speech a few days ago about threatening uh, to crush those who are traitors of Chinese nation, uh, those who are supporting Taiwan independence. So those are some, you know, um, somewhat threatening words. And you also see the TV showing footage uh, about um, some other Chinese military exercise in southeastern China. And yet all these youngsters sitting in a diner, they'll just, you know, check out YouTube on their phone or texting their friends. <laughs> Uh, just like you normally would on any other lunchtime. Um, so I'll say people are, are calm enough for the most part. The island of Taiwan is separated from mainland China by the Taiwan Strait, a body of water around 180 kilometers wide. In mid-October, the U.S. and Canada each sent a warship through the Taiwan Strait. China, which claims sovereignty over Taiwan, called the U.S. the greatest creator of risks for regional security. But this all followed a ramping up of Chinese military pressure on Taiwan, which the People's Republic of China views as a breakaway Chinese province. Concern is growing around the world about what China might do next in its efforts to bring Taiwan back under Chinese control. In this episode, we're exploring what the future may hold for Taiwan and China. So when did all of this ramp up again? And has this been what you would call unprecedented military pressure? Uh, I think a few things happened in September. There was obviously AUKUS, the Australia-UK-US Trilateral Security Initiative. The deal will deliver nuclear-powered submarines to the Australian Navy to promote stability in the Indo-Pacific region, which has come under increasing pressure from China. Uh, there was also the CPTPP issue. China says it opposes Taiwan joining a major trans-Pacific trade deal just days after Beijing said it wanted to become a member of the same agreement. When both China and Taiwan announced their application for uh, joining this multilateral free trade agreement for the Indo-Pacific. And then Taiwan's KMT, uh, which is Taiwan's main opposition party, uh, was having their own very heated uh, election to elect a new leader as well. And the election was basically over China policy for the most part. So the new KMT leader is Dr. Zhu Lilun, Eric Chu. The new Taipei Mayor Eric Chu was elected KMT chairman on Saturday. A U.S. friendly candidate. So he won in a four-way election, uh, but with a humbling 45% of the vote only. All those happened in second half of September. And then you fast forward to 1st of October. That's PRC, uh, China's National Day. Starting from that day, you had a lot of um, Chinese warplanes flying into the vicinity of Taiwan, what they call ADIZ, uh, Air Defense Identification Zones. Taiwan has reported the largest ever incursion by the Chinese Air Force into its air defense zone. 
38 Chinese Air Force fighter jets flying in two waves caused... Leader Su John Chang says that the island needs to be on alert in response to what he called China's over-the-top military activities and violations of regional peace. And for about four days, from October 1st to the 4th, there was almost 150 airplanes in total over that four days span. And these were not just any flights. This was a record number of flights during those four days. Is that right? Oh, indeed. I think um, somewhere in like 34, 35 uh, per day on average. Uh, that's a new record uh, for sure. And that's why people think it's uh, it's serious. There have also been some harsh words on both sides, uh, a ramping up of rhetoric, if you will, from the Chinese president Xi Jinping uh, and from the Taiwanese president Tsai Ing-wen. So what have they been saying? Thankfully, I think on the whole, uh, both Chinese president Xi Jinping as well as Taiwan's uh, president Tsai Ing-wen show a little bit more moderation and uh, return to patience with their recent speeches on uh, October 9th and 10th, respectively. So let's talk about Xi Jinping's speech for a little bit. President Xi Jinping has said that unification should be achieved peacefully, but he didn't rule out the potential use of force to achieve that goal. He talks about seeking unification through peaceful means is still in the best interest of the Chinese nation. And that the Taiwan issue arose uh, because of China's weakness. And so the Taiwan issue will also be resolved with the great revival of the Chinese nation. So uh, these two things put together, I think uh, President Xi is trying to say that in contrast with all the escalation in military tension that we've been seeing uh, lately, uh, everyone chill. Uh, peaceful invocation is still the preferred instrument uh, for bringing Taiwan into China's fold. Uh, he's also kind of urging for more patience strategically as well when he said that Taiwan issue will be resolved with the revival of the Chinese nation, meaning give it a bit more time, uh, let China grow its power more first. And when one day China becomes so strong that it can have much better options than it has today. So that's President Xi. So with President Tsai in Taiwan. President Tsai Ing-wen delivered the traditional National Day address in the morning, stating Taiwan's resolve to uphold its sovereignty and defend itself. I think the main message is that she thinks uh, she is going to hold on to the status quo and that she will not initiate any unilateral change from her. And any change should it come about will be brought about on the basis of the existing constitutional order, i.e. Uh, she won't be changing the name of Taiwan uh, anytime soon from the official name right now, which, which is Republic of China, to maybe Republic of Taiwan or something like that. And she also said that any change will have to be coming from bottom up and it has to be in line with the wishes of Taiwanese people. The Taiwanese people you mentioned before are alert, but not generally alarmed by these record numbers of airplanes coming into the area. Can you walk us through that, what the reasons why that might be? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one simple reason is that they've seen it before and they've seen it many, many times. Uh, well, one way to call it is alarm fatigue. Uh, so Taiwan has been governing itself uh, separately from China ever since 1949. So really, uh, military tension has always been there in the back burner for the last 72 years. And especially in the last quarter century or so, since the lead up to the 1996 first direct presidential election in Taiwan, uh, that's when China is really seriously further up their game in terms of staging more uh, military threat exercises against Taiwan. And uh, so Taiwanese people, they've seen it for too long and you can't really live in a constant state of existential crisis because it's bad for your mental health. And it's bad for the quality of your democracy as well, anyway. And really, um, there's also a bit of a, um, what's that story from Aesop's fable, something about the boy who cried a wolf. If China says they're going to take over you, you with force once, you take it seriously. They do it twice, you take it seriously. By the, I don't know, the, the hundredth time, at some point, you have to look at things other than their words to judge their intention. <laughs> So right now, I think Taiwanese are still uh, not overly alarmed just yet.
Other experts are also cautious about reading too much into the latest display of Chinese military might over Taiwan. My name is Olivia Zhang, and I'm a research fellow at the SOAS China Institute, SOAS University of London. I am currently working on a project on the political thought of Xi Jinping, where I am looking at his strategic thinking. Why, in your view, is this happening now? The military tension we saw in early October has been a culmination of China's、um, Grey Zone strategy. And what it means is China under Xi Jinping keep trying to ramp up pressure and push the threshold on what is acceptable in China's conduct with Taiwan without trying to go into war outright. So gray zone strategy is about strategic ambiguity, keep on using intimidation and building up pressure with the view that it would cause your enemies. Um, to fear and cause them to react、um, in an irrational way that would maximize your advantage. So we see China using the Great Zone Strategy under Xi Jinping towards Taiwan, not only in the past few weeks, but you know throughout the years. And under him, that was made very clear. The idea of reunifying Taiwan with the People's Republic of China has been around for more than half a century. And、while it's crucial to China's policy towards Taiwan today, it used to be the other way around. There was a very bloody Chinese civil war,、um, leading to the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949.、Um, the rulers of、um, China at that time, they were the Nationalist Party. They lost to the Chinese Communist Party during the civil war, and as a result of that defeat, they retreated to the island of Taiwan, and that marked the beginning of a separation of rule between Taiwan and the mainland. And initially,、um, the Taiwanese authorities at that time they were very strong about like taking back the mainland. They wanted to reunify China. And in the mainland, they said the same. They wanted to take back Taiwan and establish a reunified country. So the cause for unification, actually, in the initial years, you know, late 1940s, early 1950s, really came from both sides. But we saw that you know demand for taking back the mainland gradually being dropped from Taiwan as China becoming stronger and stronger economically. And China, in itself, keep pressing Taiwan to reunify with the mainland, and those demands are being much more strongly vocally expressed under Xi Jinping, who saw reunifying with Taiwan a key part to the national rejuvenation of China. This China dream of national rejuvenation is central to the Chinese Communist Party's Taiwan strategy. Xi Jinping raised the China dream for the first time within two weeks after he came into power back in 2012. The long form is the China dream of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Now, in early October, when Xi Jinping talked about the China dream again, he actually said, "You know, the idea of national rejuvenation came from、um, Dr. Sun Yat-sen." Who was the founder of the Nationalist Party, a party that retreated to Taiwan、um, in 1949? So the idea being that national rejuvenation is something of a common wish of the entire Chinese nation, and that include, in Xi Jinping's perspective,、um, the people of Taiwan. So China dream would require、um, a China to be strong internationally and to be recognized as such. And because of that,、um, taking back Taiwan is seen as a very crucial part of completing the China dream. Is there a timeline for all of this? In the 19th Party Congress back in 2017, Xi Jinping articulated a very clear roadmap and timetable towards national rejuvenation. The idea is to achieve national rejuvenation by 2049. That would be the centenary of the People's Republic of China. And before 2049, Xi Jinping wants significant, obvious progress towards national rejuvenation to be achieved by 2035. It would seem to me very strongly that if Taiwan isn't under the sovereignty of the People's Republic of China by 2049, then national rejuvenation would have been failed, and that cannot be the case in Xi Jinping's perspective because that would mean that. The Chinese Communist Party is not credible, and that would be a very, very serious legitimacy crisis that he or the party cannot afford to take.
You've written recently about Xi Jinping's global strategy, which you've called this uninterrupted rise. How does this intimidation of Taiwan fit within that Xi Jinping thought? So first of all, um, the Taiwan issue is at the heart of China's relationship with the U.S. China sees the main reason why its comprehensive national strength is not high is because um, the U.S. has a strategy of blocking China. So if China can take back Taiwan, it would show the Chinese people and show Xi Jinping that it has sufficiently um, overpowered the U.S. And that is very essential as a signature, a marker of uninterrupted rise. The other thing which is very important is Xi Jinping has defined Taiwan as a matter of Chinese sovereignty. And he has adopted a very robust approach to defend sovereignty. So by putting Taiwan under a sovereignty angle and by going all out with, you know, an alliance of autocrats to defend his vision of sovereignty, um, Xi Jinping makes it very clear that, you know, taking back Taiwan has to be done. Central to this global strategy is the way that Xi Jinping sees China's place in the world. The quote that Xi Jinping uses a lot is that we are witnessing transformations unseen in a century. So the world is undergoing rapid change, and those transformations are in China's favor. And what he is referring to implicitly is that the U.S. is in an irreversible decline, and China is on the rise together with a block of developing countries. The West has reached the limits of its development, while China is showing great potential. These shifting global power dynamics are viewed very differently within Taiwan, where the relationship with China continues to dominate the country's political debate. How have Taiwan's political parties reacted differently to Beijing's threats and requests for unification? You know, what are their different stances on the China issue? The two main political camps in Taiwan are the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, which is the one in government right now. And the other one is the opposition, the Kuomintang uh, Party. Uh, Largely, their positions on U.S.-China relations is informed by their uh, stance on national identity. So for the ruling party, the DPP, they basically said uh, Taiwanese people are Taiwanese only in national identity, whereas the opposition thinks that um, the Taiwanese society are both Taiwanese and Chinese at the same time. Uh, So for the ruling party, the DPP, uh, when it comes to making the China choice, whether to side with U.S. or China, DPP leans a lot more towards doubling down on relationship with the U.S., So uh, President Tsai, for example, has mentioned a few times already in major policy speeches when she said there is an emerging uh, Cold War-like confrontation going on in the Indo-Pacific, and Taiwan is a frontline state. And Taiwan would like the support and friendship of of all the uh, peace-loving, like-minded liberal democracies uh, from around the world. So that's a cold word for saying uh, the ruling party in Taiwan, the side of the U.S., very unambiguously. Obviously, that then robs Beijing the wrong way. Uh, in contrast to that, the opposition, uh, the KMT, because they think they're both Taiwanese and Chinese at the same time, so Beijing tend to like them more, and Beijing tend to give the KMT a lot more benefit of the doubt. When it comes to foreign policy, KMT then try to find a more equal distance uh, policy between the U.S. and China. Uh, they have a term for it. It's called 亲美合中 in English. That means uh, make friends with the U.S., but also make peace with China too. <laughs> so uh, the opposition is a lot more ready to try to find uh, constructive ambiguity, that's also reflected in not just strategic policy, but also economic policy as well. For uh, KMT, the opposition, China is primarily framed as an economic opportunity uh, to be exploited uh, by Taiwan. 
So economic integration really accelerated under the last KMT government. Xi Jinping is still talking about unification being the ultimate goal. And I'm a little bit confused. Why is Beijing resorting to these alienating tactics, but then at the same time talking about unification? What's the whole plan here? I think the plan is that uh, Beijing is playing the long game. And so it's willing to suffer some short-term losses in terms of uh, losing hearts and minds in Taiwan. Uh, So they think that um, in the short term, their objective should be to deter Taiwan from making further moves towards independence. And so long as it can achieve that, it can avoid a showdown with U.S. and other uh, friends of Taiwan. And so uh, to best achieve that, Beijing uses a lot of escalation in military tension to highlight the risk of war should Taiwan does anything uh, towards uh, more independence, for example. But that also has the effect of really annoying the Taiwanese people. And really, it's only natural that if you put someone else in a state of near constant existential crisis for decades on end, there is little to no way you can make them like you and make them feel like you treat them as family. (laughs) And people in Taiwan, how did they think about this idea of potential reunification someday? If you look at the public opinion polls, something like 2% of Taiwanese today feel like they are primarily Chinese in their national identity. And less than 10% of people in Taiwan prefer unification with China. And I think Beijing is willing to suffer that blow in the short term because Beijing thinks so long as it can deter Taiwan independence, it will buy more time for China's peaceful rise. And then China will use that time to grow its power further down the road so that one day China can win back Taiwanese hearts and minds using other tactics. Uh, For example, Beijing may use its economic uh, opportunities to draw more Taiwanese business people as well as opinion leaders to set up shop in China. And in the hope that on the longer term, that kind of providing material interest and building enough shared economic interest with Taiwan's opinion leaders can lead these Taiwanese leaders to then go back to Taiwan and shape the public opinion atmosphere in Taiwan as well. So maybe over time they can win back uh, a favorable Taiwanese public opinion uh, towards China. But this is by no means guaranteed. And recent events in Hong Kong have also played a part in how Taiwanese see their own situation. China led a violent crackdown against Hong Kong democracy activists in 2019, and then introduced a draconian new national security law there in 2020. Olivia Cheng thinks that the events in Hong Kong have starkly demonstrated to Taiwanese people just how different their political system is to China's. Before Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, um, the Chinese governments before him, different regimes, they were a lot more open-minded. I mean, it is still an authoritarian system, but there was significantly more scope for social and economic freedom. But under Xi Jinping, that kind of scope has drastically reduced. And I think we see a very major example in what happened to Hong Kong. So when the direction of travel between China and Taiwan looks so different, then so as the possibility for reunification from the perspective of people in Taiwan, they cannot possibly imagine for the time being how reunifying with an authoritarian regime would look like when Taiwan really cherishes its democratic institutions, which the people fought very hard for. Taiwan has a sophisticated, multi-layered defence strategy known as the Porcupine Doctrine, aimed at defending itself in the event of a military invasion. But how realistic is an actual Chinese military invasion of Taiwan? I think this is definitely something that... um, China has thought about and had plans um, on how to carry it out shall the possibility um, arises. But they do not want that to happen. They don't want to invade Taiwan. And hence the Great Song strategy that Xi Jinping adopts, you know, strategic ambiguity, keep increasing pressure without actually invading. 
but like signaling that an invasion is possible and a threat is looming. Like Wen Ti, Olivia believes that Xi Jinping's plan is to keep China's intimidation of Taiwan up for so long, with so much pressure, that its leaders eventually opt for reunification as the least worst option. Obviously, we are very far from that. But if we talk about, you know, 20 to 30 years from now, if China's economic clout can be maintained and um, the pressure to reunify with China within Taiwan um, would only increase. So you think that's the longer term kind of strategy that, you know, China will hope that Taiwan will just come and make a deal? But you see, it's a very dangerous strategy because we are really only talking from China's perspective and how Taiwan would react as if, you know, the world only have, you know, China and Taiwan. But that's not true at all. I mean, we haven't talked about international actors, you know, Australia, Japan, the US, the whole Asia Pacific. How are these countries going to react? I mean, their alliances and like what would it mean if there are a lot more military exercises in the Asia Pacific region? You know, how does it affect the calculation? So we are talking about a situation that is moving and, and is changing rapidly. The very major variable is how, you know, the U.S. and other um, countries would react and how that would influence um, China's take. And I think that is something we have to consider as well, because China um, currently cannot afford a complete decoupling with the rest of the world, with the advanced Western countries. Economically, that would put China in a very bad position. And the Chinese Communist Party, at least at this stage, cannot afford to do this. So that would suggest that it does have a very strong interest to keep the status quo. But the danger that we are seeing now is if China keep using a gray zone strategy, keep doing very you know assertive, aggressive military signaling and a very aggressive foreign policy posture towards Taiwan, um, how far would this gray zone strategy last? I mean, you are moving very, very close to a full-blown escalation without escalation. But that is very dangerous because you are signaling to other countries of your intention and they would interpret it in the way that they already are doing. And that is leading to significant tension in the region that would make an accident increasingly likely. So my my main question is, you know, what is a hard stop to China's gray zone strategy? And what are the things that it would not do full stop in a strategy of ramping up pressure towards Taiwan? The danger of Xi Jinping is that increasingly things that we think China would not do, um, he has done. I guess the question as well is whether the US would step in to defend Taiwan against China. I think it would put the US in a very difficult position. If the US doesn't defend Taiwan, if an invasion does happen, it would call into serious question the U.S. commitment to Asia Pacific and to countries around the world that the U.S. Um, have formed an alliance with, and there are many such countries. So that would be a very serious test on the U.S. credibility. You know, the two major superpowers in the world going into war against each other is hardly a good scenario. So from the U.S. perspective, avoiding that um, possibility is also very important. There would be very major negative um, repercussions. You can read more about Taiwan and the situation it's facing on The Conversation. We'll put some links to further reading in the show notes. Okay, for our next story, we're joined from Toronto by our colleague, Vinita Srivastava, host of another podcast here at The Conversation. Hey, Vinita. Hi, Gemma. Hi, Dan. Hey, Vinita. It's great to have you with us today. We're talking to you because you've just launched the second season of your show, Don't Call Me Resilient. And we're about to hear an excerpt from a recent episode that you just did. So tell us, what's this episode about? So on this episode, we discussed this idea of people falsely claiming Indigenous identity. And basically, these are white or mostly white folks pretending to be indigenous. Some people call it race shifting. Some people call it stolen identities. How are these people claiming indigenous identity? You know, that can be complicated. Sometimes their claims are based on old, unexamined family myths that just get passed down. And sometimes it's a genetic test that reveals an indigenous ancestor from the 1700s. But... Many indigenous people say that being indigenous is more than just genealogy. 
They define it as being claimed by a community and having lived Indigenous experiences. Others, they say, are simply pretending and in doing so take away limited resources meant for Indigenous peoples. And is this something that happens a lot? Well, it seems like it happens too often, yes. There have been some pretty high-profile cases recently. This summer, the New York Times wrote about a professor in the U.S. who continues to claim Cherokee ancestry. And in Canada, at Queen's University, an anonymous report called out several faculty and staff for falsely claiming Indigenous identity. A letter signed by more than 100 Indigenous scholars across the country was sent to the university calling on them to do better. And Benita, we've now got an extract of the episode you did on this. And this is a conversation between you and two scholars who signed that letter. So can you introduce them for us? Sure. This was such a great conversation. I spoke with Veldon Coburn, assistant professor in the Institute of Indigenous Research and Studies at the University of Ottawa. He's Algonquin from Pickwacknigan First Nation. And I also spoke with Celeste Pedri Spade, who's an artist and an associate professor in Indigenous Studies at Queen's University. She's an Anishinaabe from Lac des Mille Lac First Nation. Thanks for having us. Miigwech, thank you. So a question for both of you, and I think it is important that we start here first, but what does identity mean to you? It's such an easy answer. Like the first question people ask you is, oh, like, you know, who's your grandmother? Who's your mother? Mm. Who's your aunt? Mm. And you just answer that. So you're always being checked on within your community. Like it's not identity policing. It's not, you know, exploiting your privacy. It's how we've always done things as mm-hmm. Anishinaabe, as Ojibwe people. So it's paramount to think about that is, you know, who claims you like being in relationships with people that are also from families that are connected to Lactam Lak First Nation, to Nazade Kang, that's our name, place of poplars, and to understand, you know, our history with place and with people. And that informs who we are. And it always has. They're taking legitimate political identities, and, and every identity is fairly political in a sense, but formalized national citizenship that we had once managed ourselves yeah. and reducing it to cultural flavors of right. those who you know show up to a powwow or who say that they uh, they picked up a dream catcher at the truck stop and decided to hang it in the rear view mirror of their car and and they feel some sort of connection. It's, uh, it's not at all like that. It's uh, individuals with political, economic, social, and civil rights that are attached to their membership in a political community. It's not about a person's right to acknowledge their Indigenous ancestor, let's say, from the 18th or the 17th century, right? It's really, to me, an issue that people are exploiting Indigeneity to occupy positions that, by and large, are created through equity, diversity, and or truth and reconciliation initiatives. So to me, when you bring in people to those spaces when they've never faced discrimination based on their cultural, racial, political, or socioeconomic status, and also have never shouldered the intergenerational trauma related to Indian residential schools, then you're really missing your mark. Like the people who are claiming, you know, indigeneity based on like this long ago ancestry are simultaneously refusing to acknowledge that their entire claim is based on a biological trace of Indigenous blood in their genetic story. Mm -hmm. You know, there's probably like 50 other people that they actually work with that could say the same thing. Why is it that they're claiming indigeneity and like the 49 other people aren't. So so these are the kinds of stories where you hear like, I mailed out my DNA kit and it came back and it's showing up <laughs> this thing kind of like it's a... Or, or mining the archive. Yeah. You know, it's very extractive. It's like this idea of like, I'm going to intentionally mine like my family archive in order to be able to find, you know, that one unidentified native woman. Why would anybody want to do this? Why would anybody want to falsely claim Indigenous identity? And and why are they doubling down, you know, on the claim (laughs) after they're called out? It is a little bit surprising because being Indigenous for the longest time, for hundreds of years, is not a prized identity. So I'm not sure where someone wants to say, you know what, 
that highly denigrated identity is one that I'm going to adopt for myself and wear it out. That This is the one that I fantasize now. Like I've denigrated you for it. Now I fantasize to be you. What's that about? Right. So I think that's part of sort of the work that Indigenous peoples we've done for ourselves. So for the last maybe 40 or 50 years, you know, Native Pride, which is sort of a banner of a slogan that's emerged out of the Red Power movement is to reinvigorate Indigenous pride in ourselves when so much had been taken. Mm -hmm. And working on that, despite all of the racism and the negative stigma that's been attached to being Indigenous since contact almost, why, what would possess anyone to say one of the worst, the most stepped on identities is one that, you know what, I'm just going to slide in very sneakily and adopt I think it's because of the sort of cultural zeitgeist in the moment that we're in right now is that after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, after the National Inquiry and Missing Murder Indigenous Women and Girls and the work, like extremely painful, especially after Idle No More, that some people thought it might be kind of trendy. And again, it's never really any of the, um, the baggage that we have. A lot of people really only want to take whatever sort of good that they can from it. But is it also part like I want to be someone or I want to have some meaning in my life or I want yeah, sympathy I, or I don't, I don't, you know, any of those things? Sometimes. And I have discussions with other colleagues and I have no background in psychology or what have you, but um, understanding attitudes, beliefs, and norms and studying that from, you know, political science sort of background and social science is wondering about what prompts an individual to reorient themselves in such a way. I sometimes wonder about the personality type that it takes that um, they would abandon their vast majority of say settler colonial identity as, you know, white Anglo-Saxon colonials, where if you go back 10 generations, I believe it's 4,096 ancestors and one magical ancestor is enough to override I mean, the majority of your ancestry and heritage has is, is been violently colonial. And so it's sort of a, a colonial privilege of theirs is that uh, one day they can be white settler colonials. The next day, if they feel like it, they'll be indigenous, whereas we'll always be indigenous and we'll never be fully welcome in, in white spaces. Mm-hmm. And, and people who say, well, what's the harm in that? Well, one of the more very pressing material issues was about the Algonquin Modern Treaty. 36,000 square kilometers are on the table. And after 40 years, the negotiations have whittled us down to 476 square kilometers. That's 1.3% of our territory that we will be left with. And the reason why is mostly because of people who came out of the woodwork in the last 20 years after my community, Pickwaknagon, did the majority of the work and started to claim these distant ancestors, and many of them have been proven to not be in Algonquin, let alone Indigenous whatsoever, because we've had um, sort of adjudication and alternative dispute resolution mechanisms where we've said, wait a second, this ancestor that you're coming to is not even Algonquin, let alone Indigenous, mm. that you're claiming gives you the right to vote and actually negotiate, be at the negotiation table and make claims and give away what we're now at 88.3% of our territory. Oh, so they so they have the right to vote, basically. That's the issue. Then they become a member of this nation and have the right to vote regarding the land holding. They actually don't even become a, a member of the nation. They, the Crown has only recognized them as Algonquin for the sole purpose of modifying and extinguishing our title to territory oh. and rights. So they may never even actually be beneficiaries, whereas all the people in my small community of 2,500 people, and not all of them are adults, so they don't all get to vote. There's only about 1,800 of us, but the the number of Algonquins voting on this has exploded to 8,600. And most of them, my community says, you're drawing your ancestry back to the graveyard. So the consequences are so real when it comes to transfer of title to the crown or maintaining access to land. That's right. It's yeah. basically having an outsider come in and ensuring that your title be extinguished. So, but um, it, it runs a gamut. You know, it could be anything too from skewing statistics on say key socioeconomic indicators. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For instance, my own research, and I was bewildered by this back in 2016 when I was looking at post-secondary education outcomes is that in Newfoundland of all the places 
they had closed the post-secondary education outcome gap. So in the rest of the country, university attainment between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous population in Canada usually runs at about 14%. We've been doing okay. That's for university degrees. Now, in Newfoundland, the Indigenous population happens to be more educated. And so why is that? Hmm. And I, cu- I couldn't understand how that happened when the rest of the country is, you know, is still showing such uh, differences in socioeconomic outcomes. The reason was in 2011, everyone in Newfoundland, you know, and their dog was identifying as Indigenous because of the new landless reserve community of Halapu. Mm. So at that time they were creating the, and, and it doesn't have, it's, you know, basically there is no reserve community for it, but they created the band and the crown accepted about 118,000 applications to be considered indigenous. And part of the proof was, have you ever identified as indigenous elsewhere, like on a census? So the census data skewed things because, well, you know, we no longer need to invest in post-secondary education for Indigenous people in Newfoundland because they're actually outperforming the non-Indigenous population. Right. So the consequences are, are intense. So it really can impact social policy, health policy, education policy, where money and resources get allocated. Right. So it's about the distribution of benefits and burdens in society and the perception that we have. Mm. And, you know, it can also go back to popular representation. So you know, with the pretendians, you you opened up today and you said, well, you know, we're, we're starting to stop tolerating them yeah. because, well, they're cartoonish and clownish. It's sort of a parody and a caricature of who we are because the way they sort of present themselves, you'll see, you know, other Indigenous people like conferences and say, who is that person <laughs> who showed up to a conference wearing feathers and leather? What are they talking about? I don't recognize a single thing that they're talking about because they're making it up. One of the most obnoxious things about pretendians is them being the white people is that they um, sort of recenter and reframe, I guess, the emotive and affective state of, of affairs is that when something traumatic comes out, oh, yeah. they're there to comfort the white people. It's like, mm. you know what? We forgive you. Um, don't feel bad. Please don't feel bad, you know, about your colonial history. It's like, wait a second, yeah. we're here to mourn right now. Yeah. And it's not about like coddling. It's not about you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much, Vanita, for sharing that with us. And I know that's just one of six episodes that you're doing in this season. What other topics can people listen and hear about? We are covering a number of topics that look at how racism permeates our everyday lives. And that includes our mental health. It includes climate change. It includes food. And it also includes this idea of creeping surveillance and how surveillance amplifies racist policing. Everyone should subscribe to make sure they don't miss any of those conversations. So go and search for Don't Call Me Resilient on your podcast app of choice. And thank you so much, Vanita, for coming on. Thank you so much, both of you. Thanks, Vanita. Take care, guys. To end this week's episode, we've got some recommended reading from Lutfi Zulfika, Education and Young People's Editor at The Conversation in Indonesia. Hi, my name is Lutfi Zulfika, an editor at The Conversation based in Jakarta. My first recommendation is an article by Niaz Asadula from the University of Malaya. Since the return of the Taliban to power, concern has been growing over the quote-unquote Islamization of Afghan society, including the education sector. Many fear that either schools will be shut down or girls will be excluded, reversing 20 years of progress in narrowing the gender gap in school enrollment. However, many Muslim-majority countries around the world provide examples on how Islamic values can go hand-in-hand with fostering girls' education. Indonesia, for instance, runs the world's largest network of Islamic schools. These schools not only have provided schooling access for millions of girls, but have also consistently achieved gender balance in enrollment over the past decade. Niaz argues that Indonesia's Islamic schools can be a model for Afghanistan and that the Taliban must not abandon the crucial agenda of educating girls in the country. Our second story comes from Widya Agustina, an associate professor at Universitas Katolik Atmajaya. Aside from its world-renowned instant noodles, Indomie, which is popular in many countries from Australia to Nigeria, 
Indonesia has another culinary rising star in the form of its shrimp-based chili paste called sambal terasi. The ingredient has been used by many world-class chefs and similar shrimp-based ingredients are also used in Thai, Vietnamese, and Korean cuisine. However, the Indonesian variant contains up to five times more peptide, a compound known for enhancing flavor. In the article, Widya outlines a number of strategies to improve Indonesia's export of the product. Can it be the next Indomie? Only time will tell. That's it from me. Have a great day. Lutbi Zulfikada in Jakarta. That's it for this week. Thank you to all the academics who've spoken to us for this episode and to the conversation editors, Justin Bergman and Vinita Shivastava, and to Jonathan Est, Stephen Kahn, and to Alice Mason for our social media promotion. You can find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, on Instagram at theconversation.com, or email us podcast at theconversation.com. And you can also sign up for The Conversation's free daily email by clicking the link in the show notes. If you're enjoying The Conversation Weekly, please leave us a rating or review wherever podcast apps allow you to. And tell your friends and family about the show too. The Conversation Weekly is co-produced by Mend Marawani and me, Gemma Ware, with sound design by Eloise Stevens. Our theme music is by Nita Sal. And I'm Dan Marino. Thanks for listening.